Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with the director of the amazing and long-standing jazz non-for-profit force known as Jazzmobile. This is Robin Bell Stevens. She spoke with Neon Jazz about a monolith in the jazz world. It all began in 1964 in New York City with Dr. Billy Taylor and ended up attracting the likes of John Coltrane, Jimmy Heath, Dizzy Gillespie, Horace Silver, and many others for annual summer concerts, educational opportunities, and being a general beacon for keeping jazz alive in America. Robin graciously described the past, present, and future of an organization that has given so much to the world and to jazz. So please dig this interview, my friends. Thanks for taking a little time out for me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I have been, as I mentioned before, I have heard so many great things about Jazzmobile that I think it's only prudent for me to do an actual feature and to really kind of bring it more to the people. So, um, again, thank you for your time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of jump in here and get involved with what's going on today, but I kind of want to arc through the history of Jazzmobile. So for the hyper present of what's going on, what's happening with Jazzmobile these days? Basically, just for a quick background, Jazzmobile was founded in 1964, with Dr. Billy Taylor and Daphne Arnstein. And then once the organization was founded, Billy called his really good friend and someone I'm sure your listeners will know, Mr. Jimmy Heath. And Jimmy Heath, together with Billy, actually created the programs. Two of the core programs are the Saturday Jazz Workshop and the Jazz Mobile Summerfest, which is used to be called the Free Mobile Jazz Concert Series, which got to be a little wordy, which is why we um, managed to, to shorten it all to Jazzmobile Summerfest. And then we also have as a core program the lecture demonstrations, which is where we go into different locations, usually a public school, where we introduce to some of the students and present to others what jazz music is. So we continue to do that. So this being the summertime, we have kicked off the 2016 Jazzmobile Summerfest, and we began in July, and we will end on August 31st officially. Wonderful. Those early summer mobile concerts had to be amazing times for the, the kickoff and the amount of talent that was there. Talk to me about those early concerts. So the early concerts, actually, um, Billy Taylor used to love to tell this story that when we first got started, well, let me just back up a little bit. One of the reasons why Billy decided to create Jazzmobile, he was very active in the civil rights movement and worked very closely with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Billy actually wrote a song, and whenever Billy would show up at a rally or a special presentation where Dr. King was speaking, he would turn to Billy and say, hey, play that jazzy gospel song for me. And that song, which a lot of your listeners I'm sure know, was called, I Wish I Would Know How It Would Feel to Be Free. And that became sort of a theme song, if you will. So after that, when Billy came back to New York, came to Harlem, you may, some of your listeners may recall that it was a somewhat turbulent time in a number of urban centers around the country back in 1964. And Harlem in that regard was no different. So he really wanted to bring this jazz music into those neighborhoods in Harlem where there was some unrest going on. And in addition, he wanted to bring the music to the people that actually nurtured jazz music when it came into New York and helped to develop it and create it. Uh, Minton's Playhouse, which some of your listeners may be aware of, was right here in Harlem, and that's where Thelonious Monk founded Bebop and with Max Roach and others. So he really felt connected to the Harlem community and jazz specifically. And he also realized back then in particular, it was not easy for the residents of Harlem to go downtown to some of the clubs and concert halls and buy high price tickets that were um, required in order to hear good free jazz music. There was no place you could go to hear um, to hear the music. And let me qualify, correct myself. The concerts in the concert halls and the clubs were not free. Uh, you certainly had to pay. But he wanted to m- make the music free for the people in the community. So that was how we got started. So who did we present? Just about anyone you can think of, from Count Basie to Duke Ellington to Sarah Vaughan to uh, Jimmy Heath, who's still performing with us, I'm happy to say, and and many others of the greats of that time, Donald Byrd. Like I said, just about any jazz artist you can think of was happy to perform in a jazz mobile concert. And speaking of the concerts back then, we actually had a float 
which was not owned by Jazzmobile, but we did rent it. And it was very much what I like to say, sort of New Orleans in style. It was a flatbed truck with a white wrought iron fence with a black and white Surrey on top. And it actually would travel from neighborhood to neighborhood. And when it first got started, the float actually would be moving while the musicians were playing. And so if you can imagine what a challenge that would be in and of itself, but add to the mix that in those days the streets were not as well paved in that neighborhood as they should have been in, uh, as, and as they were in others. Let's say like on East 68th Street off Park Avenue was not the same thing as 132nd Street anywhere, um, river to river. So that being said, that came to a halt. Traveling, yeah, so then we just would just go into the neighborhoods, park it, and then perform. And that worked very, very well for many, many decades. So were those early concerts packed with the amount of talent that was coming through? I mean, you even had Coltrane and obviously Dizzy Gillespie, Horace Silver, Sun Ra, mm-hmm. a lot of folks like that. Were they pretty packed concerts? Oh, okay. So let me define packed for you. So the answer to your question is yes. So the purpose of the concerts were to bring the concerts to a particular block. So it's not like it was where we are today in the, when, they, when we first got started, say like in a central park where you can hold 5,500 people, right? So it was in a neighborhood. It was really meant for the people in that block and the surrounding area. So, yes, the blocks, the block where we were located were packed, absolutely were packed. And I should also just add a little bit about the neighborhoods when uh, – John Lindsay was mayor. There, he One time he just showed up because he and Billy Taylor had a relationship, a friendship, if you will. John Lindsay would just show up if he was available. He knew about the concerts. He knew Billy was going to be there. So, you know, he would come in just to check it out himself. Well, one or two of the times when he went, he saw the condition of the neighborhood, everything from the garbage not having been picked up to the potholes in the street. And the next morning, as the story goes, heads would, quote, roll. Jazzmobile ended up providing sort of a, a goodwill community service, although that wasn't the original plan, that whenever um, a city agency or a block knew that we were coming in there and the city agency knew about it, quite coincidentally, they would come in, garbage was picked up, streets were paved, and fire hydrants were working, and it was a different situation. So that was sort of like the added value to the community back in the day. Beautiful. So the organization starts in 64, and obviously we rolled into 2016. Throughout the decades, the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, how has this organization evolved? How have things progressed to 2016? Okay. So uh, there were a number of different things that have happened over the years. Um, I would say... When I, in addition to that particular program that we are doing, the ones that I mentioned, the core programs, along the way, Philip Morris came to Jazzmobile, this is before I got there, of course, and said, this one's got this great idea. We would like to take jazz and take it on the road in another kind of way. We want to tour nationally and internationally. And we've come up with an idea that we're calling the Philip Morris Super Jazz Band. And we'd like Jazzmobile to help us flesh out the idea and to actually be the producers of it. So for over 10 years, that's what we did. So with the funding from Philip Morris, we toured throughout Europe, Hong Kong, the Orient, and um, major cities in the U.S. as well. And also during that time, a couple of other corporations like Michelob Beer um, partnered with us and New York State Council of the Arts partnered with us and Department of Cultural Affairs to help build the Summerfest program as at the same time we were growing an, a national brand through the sponsorship of Philip Morris. So that was one thing that happened. And again, um, because as I, as you may also know, Jazzmobile programming is basically free programming. All the concerts that I've mentioned were all free concerts. So somebody has to pay for them. So the way they got paid for back in the day, corporate and government funding was where most of the funding was coming from at that time. And then as is norm, corporations change focus and interest, and then Philip Morris actually moved out of the New York City as its headquarters, and they changed ownership, changed names. So during all of that process, the 10-year relationship came to an end, and again, they changed their focus in terms of the kinds of things they were going to support. So Philip Morris, as we know it, no longer exists. So that put an end to that particular program. But then Throughout, we've maintained some of us in our education programming. Again, so as we talk about the morphing and changing, at one time we owned a building, 
on 127th Street, 154 West 127th. And we owned that until about 2007. Along the way, um, as happened with a number of other not-for-profit organizations, the as the economy changed, and especially if you don't have any earned revenue stream and your only revenue is coming from direct donations, you have to take what, what's called, in my world, an impact. And the impact that Jazzmobile took was that as the funding decreased, we had to make some other changes within how we, number mainly how we were structured in terms of where we were housed and how we were handling that. So when I took over the organization, it became very apparent that in order to move forward with our programming, we would have to make some changes. And one of the changes that we made is that we actually sold the building. When the building was first purchased, the vision was that we would take over the entire building and it would become the Jazzmobile Institute with a lot of programming taking place right there in the building as opposed to just being mobile as it had been. But by the time I joined the organization, that vision clearly had not happened and it didn't seem like it was going to happen any time in the near future, due in large part because of uh, the fact that there were tenants in the building in order to help sustain us. And the feeling of the board at the time was that we were that's not what our vision is really to own a building for the purpose of having, having tenants. And then there were some other things that obligations we needed to take care of. And selling the building was the easiest and best way to do that. So we successfully sold the building then. Right around 2008, when the uh, recession hit, Again, Jazz will be like another of other organizations had to go back and say, okay, fine, we need to take another look and see how we're going to handle sustainability and growth. So all of that said, we are now in what we are calling a uh, going through a reorganization and a ramp up. But throughout all of this time from 1964 to today, we Summerfest has continued every year, as have the education program has continued every year as our core programs. But also during this time, we instituted some other uh, new programs that were meant to have a finite beginning and a finite end, so they were done more as a test to see, okay, is there an audience for this and an audience with a capital A, meaning obviously in terms of sustainability for the audience to come and support it, as well as sponsorship to come and support it, and that it still is it relevant to what our mission is. An example of those is we did a winter fest, we did a vocal fest, and we did a jazz vocal competition. Of the three, the competition was the one that had the most interest, and we are actually planning to relaunch that uh, coming in 2017. Another program that we did, um, we did for five years, and that was in partnership with the Apollo Theater Foundation, the Harlem Stage Gatehouse, and our collaborator um, for five years was Columbia University. And that was a week-long celebration of the wonderful jazz shrines of Harlem. And the primary focus was on the former shrines, like Minton's Playhouse, like the Lennox Lounge, like the Savoy Ballroom, etc. And then we would also include as part of our focus the celebration of the new jazz shrines. So that went on for five years. Again, our, it was something we did in partnership. And at the end of the fifth year, our partners, we all came together and we regrouped, and a decision was made that that particular version of the Harlem Jazz Shrine Festival wasn't really working well for everybody in the partnership. So that well, the last one we did for that was in 2015. But again, Jazzmobile is looking at the 2017-18 fiscal year to see how we might bring it back in another configuration. So how did you get involved with the organization? I got involved with the organization. Actually, a one of the supporters of Jazzmobile was the Louis Armstrong Educational Foundation. And um, she had recommended to the organization that they talk to me to see if I might be interested in getting involved in some way. And that I did. It must have been around 1994, 95. I came on board as a consultant to help them take a look at their programming and other ways they might want to go about uh, raising funds. Then in 2007, 2000, and let me get that year straight, 2003 actually. 2003 is when they, the same uh, organization, the woman's name is C.V. Jacobs, by the way, knew that the then 
executive director was looking to move on and suggested that they come to me and see if that might be something that I would be interested in. So that's the more direct answer of how I got here today. But going back further than that, my late father was a bass player by the name of Aaron Bell, and he had played with the Duke Ellington Orchestra. So I literally grew up loving the music, hearing the music, and knew that I, at some point in my life I would find a way to make a career out of it. So along the way, I um, had my own consulting business, and I was the executive producer for many years of the Jackie Robinson Foundation Afternoon Jazz Festival. I was then tapped by um, Jazz at Lincoln Center with Wynton Marsalis to join their team as a director of marketing and creative services. And it was while I was there, um, I was tapped by Jazzmobile and asked to come join them and become the executive director. So I was officially at Jazz at Lincoln Center actually for less than a year when Jazz, uh, when Jazzmobile reached out to me and I accepted their offer. So let me ask you this. You, why do you love Jazzmobile so much? Mm, that, that's, um, I find it an interesting question, probably not for the way that most people would think, but I find it interesting because being that I have such a great passion for jazz, being that I am of the community and believe in the community, being that I think that jazz should be accessible to everyone, not just those who are in a position to support our great artists in, and the great venues that present them with uh, by buying tickets and season tickets and going to the nightclubs and the concert halls. Um, and like I said earlier on, like Billy Taylor, I realize not everybody's in that position to be able to do that. And needless to say, our audience has morphed and changed, but we still have that core audience. And because of the quality of the programming that we present, because of the caliber of artists that we're presenting, people are now coming from all over. And that's with a capital A, because I mean not only from New York City and the metropolitan area, but tourists and other visitors You'll find them any point in time in any one of our concerts, be it Central Park, Grant's Tomb, Marcus Garvey Park, Brooklyn Bridge Park, or even in front of the Louis Armstrong House Museum in Corona, Queens, or other parks and other places where we are presenting. When I was about 15, I had this thought about the music, and I believed that jazz needed to get to the place of critical mass. The way I defined critical mass was that two, two tracks. One track is that every school in the country be it public, private, parochial, or homeschool, is teaching music, and jazz is a major part of that curriculum. On the adult side, I had a vision that, a belief that, every adult should spend some portion of their disposable income on jazz. Wonderful if you're supporting an organization, a C buying a CD, going to a nightclub, um, in any way possible, support the music. And until everybody is doing that, in the world, we're not at critical mass. And I realized that Jazzmobile was the first to say as an institution that we need to figure out how we can institutionalize America's classical music jazz. And Billy Taylor was clearly the first one to actually do that, uh, both in terms of the programming side. In 1957, thereabouts, he had a TV show called The Subject is Jazz here in New York. And it was basically uh, what became our lecture demonstrations program. And as Stanley Cox pointed out in an article that he wrote so several, maybe 10 plus years ago, that every program that you see today that has a uh, jazz education program, either intentionally or unintentionally, is copied after what Billy Taylor created for Jazzmobile. So therefore, Jazzmobile's influence is far and wide. So let me ask you this. You know, as an institution, you've been very successful, not only in getting the, the masses to recognize and become a part of the jazz ocean, so to speak, but you've influenced a lot of children that have gone on to become musicians. Do you have any confessionals, any stories from those that are musicians these days that have been impacted heavily by Jazzmobile? There are many who have, have commented on that, and, and some of them actually acknowledge it in their bio. If you look at some of the, the younger ones, um, uh, younger to the jazz scene in that sense, someone like a Brianna Thomas, for example, Sharnae Wade, for example, both of whom happen to be vocalists, talk about how participating in the jazz on their vocal competition was very helpful to them. Uh, Gregory Porter participated in our jazz vocal competition and was one of the finalists and participated in the jazz, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Jazzmobile Vocal Fest 
that we did. He was one of the four artists that were presented in there. And actually, it was during our festival that he met his uh, now manager, was at one of our events. We introduced them. And um, again, his career has certainly taken off. Najee talks about having been, gone through our program. T.K. Blue talks about having been a, a, a student in our program. And there, are, uh, there are others. Um, there are definitely others. And we also like to mention the fact that Jazzmobile did a special concert to celebrate an anniversary year for Sarah Vaughan in show business. And it was done at Alice Tully Hall, I believe. It was done at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. And at the time, a president of the board of directors was a guy by the name of George Butler, who, of course, is very good friends with Billy Taylor. And when they were planning that program, he said, you know, Ellis's son is, you know, ready to branch out. He's been playing, you know, with other groups for so long. He wants to do his own group. Why don't we introduce him as a solo performer with his own group at this special tribute that we're doing for Sarah Vaughan? And we said, absolutely fine. You know, let's do it. So... That night, at a special tribute to Sarah Vaughan, Jazz Obeo presented the Winton Marsalis group for the first time as its own freestanding group. You would say Winton had been performing as an artist for a while then, but this was his first time with his own group. At uh, And it's quite coincidental, I guess, it was at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, where he is now the, um, the artistic director for Jazz at Lincoln Center. That's wonderful. If yeah. the common person out in the world wants to support what you do, how would those be able to either with, you know, contributions or um, do whatever donation they wanted to give, how would they do that? Right. So we have on our website, they can go to www.jazzmobile.org, and with a credit or debit card, they can click on Donate, and they can make a donation for as little as $10 on up from there. And that's the easiest way to do it. Or they can also, we have a special a mailing address for donations that come through the mail. And that can be sent to Jazzmobile, P.O. Box 8246, and that's New York, New York, 10016. So the beauty of jazz is that it's, it's it's enduring. It's one of the greatest things this country has ever invented, and Jazzmobile has definitely been a force in that. Why is Jazzmobile so relevant, and what is it going to do to continue making jazz relevant? Jazzmobile, I would say, is relevant for a number of different reasons. I think the obvious one is that many of our followers appreciate the music. Um, the fact that we bring high-quality free programming um, to locations that are accessible, and you're accessible in that you can come with your children, you can come, you know, by yourself, you can come and with your dancing shoes, and you can swing dance on a plaza or on the street, and it's again, it's all for free. Um, and I think that the people who appreciate music, not everybody like, there are very few people in the world, and I personally don't know any of them, who only like one type of music. I think all of us, most of us, like all different kinds of music. So it's it's easy to come, and you don't have to make a major financial investment to come enjoy a great um, evening of music. But I, as I talk about our free programming and the relevancy, I think that the way we're going to maintain relevancy, though, is if we do see a switch in terms of the kinds of support and the level of support that we are getting. When we were founded, our founders were very clear that this music was meant to be for the community, by the community, and of the community. So, therefore, all of our board members, all of our partners, all of our, the people who came to us, again, when we first got started, were people from the community. But as we look to sustain and grow, we are looking at this model, and we are trying to uh, come up with ways that we can sustain ourselves by identifying people with, my polite word, more resources in order to do that. And it's not instead of, of course, it's always in addition to. So we want to maintain our core audience, our core supporters, who give those $10 donations or write a $1,000 check, and then we just need to find out a way to find those individual donors 
who are in a position to be more generous and have larger resources to support what we do, in addition to identifying more foundations, like the Louis Armstrong Educational Foundation, which as our foundation, as a foundation, is our largest supporter, and then corporations um, who also want to support the kind of programming that we're doing. And we know it's relevant when we see how the audience numbers grow. Um, I mentioned Central Park. We started something 10 years ago, of, well, longer than that, actually 25 years ago, a guy by the name of Johnny Gary, who was with our organization for over 30 years, and he was a, a brilliant guy. I mean, he's just amazing, a real, really well-known in the jazz industry. He's now 91 years old. Back in the day, he worked with Joe Williams, Sarah Vaughn. He was the first African-American to manage a downtown nightclub, a little place called Birdland. And all this before he even came to Jazzmobile. Well, he uh, was approached by the widow of Charlie Bird Parker about 25 years ago saying, you know, I want to do a birthday party that's free for the whole city to come. I think Jazz will be able to do it, and I want to do it in Central Park. So he made a contact. He had a contact in Central Park, made the call, and so it was done in this location in the park at 106th Street in Central Park West called the Great Hill. And so that's where the very first uh, Great Hill concert, jazz concert, was done. And we did it there for a couple of years. Again, this was before I joined the organization. Then the Charlie Parker Foundation was founded. And they decided that they wanted to create something called the Charlie Parker Festival. So they started doing that in a park downtown and Tompkins Square Park. And Johnny Gary was a part of producing it, stage managing it. And then as things more often changed, they started doing it uptown at Marcus Garvey Park as well. But by this time, of course, it was owned by, if you will, the Charlie Parker Foundation. And then they decided that they were ready to pass it on. So they passed it on to a wonderful organization called the City Parks Foundation, which does that program and several other programs around the city that are, a lot of them are music based programs and others that they do. And what they do is absolutely amazing. A lot of uh, people in New York know about Summer Stage, which is their program on a beautiful stage where they do their regular programming. So in addition to that, as Jazzmobile, you know, continued to to uh, build relevancy and with the Great Jazz on the Great Hill, we took it back again 10 years ago. We went back to Central Park Conservancy and said, hey, we'd like to bring this back. Are you are you interested? Would you like to partner with, on it? partner with us on it? And they very quickly said absolutely. So on August 13th, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary of Great Jazz on the Great Hill in partnership with the Central Park Conservancy. And the first year that we did it in this partnership, it was just about maybe a 1,000 people came. Um, two years ago, it had grown to 5,000, and we said, okay, fine, that's going to be the max. Well, last year, there were 5,500 people. So I think when you see those kind of numbers, when you see people calling and saying, hey, how can I get jazz up to come to my neighborhood? And unfortunately, because, again, it's free programming, there's a limit as to how many we can do. Um, but because of demand for them to come is great, and because people, and again, our numbers are growing in attendance at each festival, each concert that we present, I think that tells us that we're relevant. And why we're relevant again? Because quality programming, quality productions, and people love the music. Absolutely. So what I have heard is that there is going to be a uh, non-for-profit publishing and recording company in the works. Is that happening, or is that the future of Jazzmobile? It, I would say it's more the future Jazzmobile, but I mentioned to you about the Jazzmobile Institute that was planned many, many years ago. That was that was one of the things, as I mentioned, as having in-house programming right there. That was a part of what we were looking uh, looking to do then, and we uh, it's something that is still it's still something that we would like to do. But again, it's always about having the resources with a capital R, which for me means. Um, the financial resources to do it, and as well as the human resource capacity and capabilities to do that. So it's definitely down the road. And as I talk about that kind of a subject, we are identified along with, we have been identified with three other organizations to go into a new facility, which is uh, the working title is the Victoria Theatre Project. The Victoria Theater is a theater that was built around the time of the Apollo Theater, and it's about three doors east of the Apollo. 
the city owns, or rather the state owns it, and the city is managing it in partnership with the state. An RFP went out some years ago, and a developer has been identified. And what's being planned is that the the original structure, which is about three stories high, is going to be a retail space, like a shopping mall, if you will. And then on top of that will be a 10-story tower that will be for a hotel. And there will be another 10 stories on top for apartment rentals. And four art and cultural organizations are going to have office space in there and two performance spaces that will be in there as well. So in addition to Jazzmobile, it's the Apollo Theater Foundation, the Classical Theater of Harlem, and the Harlem Arts Alliance. All four of us have been identified to go in there. Oh, and when are we going in there, you ask? <laughs> it'll probably be it'll probably be a couple of years because um, the scaffolding has gone up, but the official groundbreaking hasn't happened yet. But once the groundbreaking does happen, we're looking at anywhere from two to three years uh, before everyone will be able to move in. And at that point, we will certainly have the space and we will certainly have the human resources and hopefully the financial resources to start doing some of these other initiatives that we have all towards helping us to grow the organization in terms of what we're doing and to also, I might add, to carry forth the mission, which is real simple, present, preserve, promote, and propagate America's classical music jazz. So let me ask you this. Since your humble beginnings in 64, going all the way into today and in the future years as Jazz Mobile goes forward, what do you want this organization's enduring legacy to be? I think the simple answer is that we were true to the mission created by our founders, Dr. Billy Taylor, Daphne Arnstein, and, of course, Jimmy Heath. But we did that by growing the appreciation for the music, by growing the number of people that are following it, if you will, as audience members. We have grown the number of people that are playing it professionally and that it has also continue to grow in stature and appreciation as a cultural art form, not only here in the U.S., but around the world. Wonderful. That is a perfect way to kind of sum everything up. Thank you for taking some time out today, Robin. I appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and organizations all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Robin for opening up about the history of a titan in jazz known as Jazz Mobile. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. And you can always visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.